okay if I stand out here rather than there? Yeah. So I'm a high school teacher. I teach Eurythmy, grades 8 through 12, and I've been doing that since 1995. I had a career 14 years in financial administration because when I was 18 years old, my father said, study something so you can get a job. And so in college, I said, who gets the most jobs? And that was the accountants. And so that's what I did because I really didn't know what to do with myself. And it actually was fine. It was a very practical skill, but I always had this kind of nagging voice in the back of my head, just there's something else that you're going to do. And I was always interested in teaching, but I wasn't interested in teaching in the public school. So it was round about um, 1990 when I read an article in the Utney Reader about Waldorf education and somehow it I, I said, that's the thing I've been looking for. So I left my job in downtown Chicago and um, studied Eurythmy, of all things, because when Rudolf Steiner speaks about the teacher, he speaks about the teacher as an artist. And I went to a Catholic school, which was fine, you know, big family, seven children in my family, and um, we, there were many good things about my education but the arts weren't one of them. So when I was thinking about becoming a Waldorf teacher, I knew I was grossly underqualified and that the study of art was going to be um, a primary deficit. So I went to a course in the arts for Waldorf teachers in Sacramento, California, this whole span of things. And there was painting and drama, creative writing, eurythmy, sculpture, and having been an athlete my whole life, I realized if I was really going to take my biography seriously and, and develop from where I was at that moment, it was through movement. And so I came here, I was 34 years old, and I spent four years in the full-time Eurythmy training here because I wanted to be a Waldorf teacher. And over the course of those four years, I learned you know, all kinds of things about the whole world of art, not just eurythmy, but music and poetry, the English language and how it has developed over time. And I didn't learn anything about children. My teacher, the director of the school there said, no, we don't do children here. When you want to study that, you have to go somewhere else. So I went to England, Southern England in Sussex, to Emerson College, and then I studied how to teach eurythmy to children. And I had the good fortune of working with Molly von Heider. She was 84 at the time. She had weathered World War II um, as a young woman. And she had worked in Stuttgart, Germany, in the Eurythmy School there when the Gestapo came knocking on the door to close the school. And so she was one of the young people out back who were taking the costumes and the choreography that had been written down out the back door while the director of the school stood and sort of held them off for a while. And they were assigned jobs in various factories around Europe. She worked at a parachute factory. And when the war was over, she then returned to Waldorf education in Summerfield, uh, which is a school in England. She taught children as a class teacher, and she was also a Eurythmy teacher. So I had the wonderful experience of working with someone that had totally immersed themselves in Waldorf education for a lifetime. And that was really inspiring. So what I wanted to share with you today was a bigger picture of Waldorf education, where early childhood is the seed. I want to tell you a little bit about the whole plant, briefly, just to set a context for what you'll hear this evening. So. I've taught all those grades now, kindergarten through 12th grade. And at the moment, I'm a class advisor of the class of 2017, which is the ninth grade, which includes Lisa's son, among many others. Um, and I have to say that teaching Eurythmy is wonderful, but the class advising is more wonderful. In a way, it's like being a, a kindergarten teacher, having relationship with parents, but also relationship with students. And where as a Eurythmy teacher, I'm an art teacher. I'm not really interacting 
um, about the rest of their day. So I can tell you, I, I wanted to start with the words of one of the high school students. So this is what he says about life. This was on Friday at an assembly. Uh, Lucas Chin said, and this comes out of their block about transcendental, the transcendentalists. Life is like a boot. If you don't have a soul, it has no purpose. So if I <laughs> try to weave in Lucas's wisdom into the context of what we're talking about, just that we're aware of the, the, the um, development in education, in public education, for a core curriculum, common core curriculum of ideas that all children need to know. And that's being given sort of a broad level of support nationally. Probably it will be legislated sometime soon. We're not bound by that as a private school. But of course, we have our own core curriculum that we study. And the core curriculum that we study is based on the developing child. So it's not on a body of knowledge that we want your children to have, but they, I would say, core capacities that we want your children to have as they approach adulthood. Of course, it means they need to know all about language. They need to be able to get into a college if they want to do that. But alongside that is the sole reality that, let me give one more quote by Martin Luther King, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. And this is the path that we're walking with your children. Of course they need to think, and of course they need to write, and they need to be able to do both of these things really well. But the other part that we take on with you, because in other educational systems, the, the capacity to stand as a strong human being in the world in times of controversy and challenge are left to the parents solely. And that, that is a difficult thing, as we know. So here, the parents and teachers working together take on the responsibility not only for the intellectual education of your children, but also the moral, you could say moral character and moral education. And that's through the soul. So in early childhood, you're, you'll hear from your teachers about what the education looks like from birth through age seven. So I won't really speak about that. But one of the phrases that we understand, that, that helps me understand it, is self-initiated movement. We want all children in the kindergarten to be able to take up their work, which is play, and to do it out of themselves, out of their own imagination, and to be able to create something. And if we've done well as teachers, as a Eurythmy teacher, as an early childhood teacher, your children will have an independent, imaginative life where they can take up the work of their play and make it happen. When we reach seven years old, that benchmark changes. And then we say self-initiated movement in relationship to an authority. So at age seven, the child begins to look for who's my guide. And you'll see that in your children as they approach that age. They want to be led. They want to be told what to do. They play school at home. They have a feeling there's someone out there who's got a story for me or a path to follow. And so we study biographies throughout the Waldorf education and the story so that we're hearing about this is how I made my way in the world. This is how he made his way in the world or she made her way in the world. And the child is integrating this story about how, how do I make my way. And so in relationship to an authority figure, they work through the soul, the arts, to, to build a sense of how I make my way. And at age 14, when puberty comes, the voice changes, girls get their periods, the reproductive uh, aspect of their lives is, is awake and alive. The other aspect of their life which is awake and alive is their capacity for thought. And what we understand at 14 is the capacity for judgment begins to glimmer 
as a possibility. It's not that they can choose in eighth grade, oh, I want to go to Harvard when I'm 18 years old. They don't actually understand the future well enough to make that decision. But what they are able to do is, in a very black and white way, say, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. And that's a very important human capacity. But that isn't the capacity to weigh up and judge. That grows slowly with the schooled capacity of thought. And that doesn't grow in age 7 to 14. Other things are happening, right? A sense of wholeness around other issues. So we say that um, in all ages of life, up until age 21, the, the ability to self-initiate is primary. Self-initiated movement in early childhood in relationship to an authority, to be able to imitate and learn, and then in thought to be able to become independent. So that's the kind of wide sweep. And the reason that we, we emphasize the arts through every step of that is what Lucas Chin says. Life is like a boot, and without the soul, it's really nothing. And, and what I mean by that is, the capacity to think happens in the soul. We understand it happens in the brain, and there's MRI that can show us where brain activity for certain things are. But when you see a child deeply focused in his work, you can see the soul engagement with the material, right? The inner human being in relationship to the outer world. This is what we mean by soul. And in order to build the capacity to connect to a life work, you, there are many steps that need to unfold. So for instance, we have a, a ninth grader who said, and then I'm going to wrap this up, um, what I love best about this school, she was new this year, is the color. She said, in my old school, everything was ugly. And you know this very well in early childhood. The rooms are so beautiful. But this emphasis on beauty, it's outer in the kindergarten, it becomes internal in the lower school, and it becomes a capacity of thought in the high school. So outer beauty, well integrated, becomes an organized and habitual pattern of thought. That's one way that we work with the soul. And to develop human speech in a way that um, students can stand and deliver clearly and articulately. That's another way that the soul engages with the world. So to have intellectual capacities, of course, are essential. But these other aspects of life are equally essential. And so um, I wanted to end with another Martin Luther King quote. It's, it's a little bit somber, but our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And with the young children, and with the grade school children, and with the high school children, the soul matters. And if we give our education over solely, I mean that primarily, to an in education of the intellect, this aspect of life that enriches everything is pale and thin. And so um, just want to give a context for birth to 21 as a soulful, as an integration of soul qualities or soul capacities. And you'll hear more about that now. So this is a seed. Thank you. So part of my introduction for my part of the presentation is introducing myself, which seems rather odd because I feel that I know all of you. And whether I've met you in the last year or um, in years prior to that, I'm still going to just say, my name is Lisa Mikio, and I'm the Director of Early Childhood Admissions. And part of my work as the Director of Early Childhood Admissions and Family Programs involves carrying and leading our parent and child program. So I teach our parent-child classes. I've been a nursery teacher as well, and also a kindergarten teacher. As Laura mentioned, I do have one child who's in the ninth grade and another son who is in 12th grade. 
So I'm also a parent. I chose this photograph to start my part of the presentation because the truth is there is no miracle greater than the miracle of birth. And whether you're a parent who's held your very own child in your arms and looked in his eyes for the first time, or you're someone who simply walked into the house where perhaps there's a newborn baby present, you felt to some degree the sense of this miracle that I'm talking about. Some parents feel that even before the miracle of birth, there is a sense or a moment of intention on the part of the child to come and become a part of our world so that not only is the moment of birth, but also the moment of conception, something that that individual has chosen. One could say that the will of the child has been involved even prior to the moment of birth. Now I'm using this word will, and I can't believe that Laura gave this whole picture of child development from birth to 21 in this broad stroke without mentioning it. So I'm going to just mention that as we talk about early childhood develop, development and what we do in the nursery and kindergarten and of course in the parent-child classes, we may mention this phrase, educating the will. And as you continue at Green Meadow, you'll hear more about educating the will educating the feeling life, and educating the thinking. So in our years, we're really focused on educating the will. And having thought that you were going to mention that, Laura, I was all ready to springboard off of that word, but we can now springboard and ask, what, what does that mean? When we say will, what in the world are we talking about when we refer to educating the will of a child? And. I'd like to quote from Michael Howard, who actually wrote a book called Educating the Will. He said that the will is often equated with action, with moving our limbs. If educating the will is simply a matter of educating our limbs, then physical exercise will suffice. Regular exercise is essential to healthy development. But developing our will is more than exercising our limbs. With our limbs, we engage in outer activity. Behind the outer activity, there is an inner activity of thoughts, feelings, and motivations. Will belongs to the inner activity. Will is the inner force behind the outer force of our limbs. There are three big accomplishments that a child makes in the first two and a half years of life. And they include learning how to walk, talk, and think. And in my portion of tonight's presentation, I'm going to highlight the steps that a child takes toward meeting all of those milestones. It takes a tremendous amount of will to learn how to walk, talk, and think. A tremendous amount of this inner force that we're talking about. We're going to start by looking at how a child begins by taking up his physical body. When we look at a newborn baby, what we notice right off is how large the head is in comparison to the rest of the body. And a child in her first year of life spends almost all of her forces trying to combat gravity so she can hold that head up freely upon her shoulders. As we look at the head, we can also notice that of the child's body, the head is the most developed part of the body. The organs are still growing and the limbs are uncontrolled. So in her first year of life, there's a lot that she has to do in order to take hold of her body, learning how to hold her head upright and manage against the forces of gravity, and learning how to control her limbs. And I thought this was just delightful. Because 
how do they take hold of their body? First, they have to discover it. They discover their body, and they tend to put everything that they discover right into their mouths, whether it's their hands, their feet, their toes. And we as parents delight in their discovery. And we delight in watching them explore these different movements that they all will go through in the same sequence of events. As we watch the baby find her foot or her thumb, we can also sense some of that intention that I talked about earlier. You can sense that in her gaze, there's a certain intention to be here. It's a gift if we allow children to go through these movement patterns and to find and discover their body without our intervention and without our distracting them. We're going to watch a video now, and Leslie's going to pull that up. And as she's doing that, I want to just plant a seed for you to think about as you're watching the video. And what I want you to look for in the child in the video, I want you to see if you can see this quality that I'm referring to in regard to this inner force, this inner motivation. And I also want you to Tell me whether, after you watch this, how it could have gone differently. What could have changed the outcome of this? This goes on for about three minutes. She continues reaching for that toy. And you can hear her breathing. Could you hear her breathing in that? And in her breath, well, I don't know. Could you sense something there? Looking at her gaze. Who would like to comment on how that was to watch this amazing activity? She just climbed Mount Everest, by the way. She's going to have a fine nap in a little while. I heard you all get excited as she got closer to getting it. We're awfully invested in these moments, aren't we? What's truly amazing is that the parent behind the camera stayed so quiet. 
And how might it have gone differently? I mean, you're all parents. You've been in this kind of situation. Sometimes grandparents or others will come in and move the toy a little closer. Any comments upon seeing that? Were you able to discern that quality, that force? What in the world propelled and motivated her to work so long? That was a long time. Could you sense the will in that child? How could it have gone differently? What if the mom or the dad did what we all did, which was really, we wanted to clap, right? We really did want to clap. How might that have shifted that? Thank you, Priscilla. Yeah. I think when I met many of you at some point during your interview process, I may have said that the hardest job being an early childhood teacher is staying out of their way. And this shows it better than almost anything, that anything the parent may have said would have directed the child's attention, that intense focus, away from the activity toward the parent. And the greatest gift that the parent provided that child with in that moment was also the belief that you can do it. I trust that you can do it. I have full confidence that you can do it. When given space and time, each baby will go through the same sequence, the same progression of movements before learning to walk. Discovery of hands and feet, the delight in playing with them, rolling over from the back onto the tummy, pulling up onto one's trunk and beginning to crawl, eventually pulling oneself up into the upright. These are all examples of just that. And given the opportunity to be left alone, every child will go through the exact same sequence. The exact same unfolding movement patterns will occur in every child. And it's the great wisdom of nature that each new physical development also lays a foundation for what's to come. There's a reason why something comes when it does, because something else is going to come later. If we observe a baby practicing rolling over from his back onto his tummy, we can see the back muscles working, the side working, and the tummy muscles working. And why is that important? Because one day when that child sits down in a chair and sits at a desk, she's going to need the torso strength required to sit in that chair. When we see a child crawling, Leslie, move along here. When you see a child crawling, there's much more going on than the child simply moving from one place to another. If you look at the child's gaze, you can see the eye activity, focusing and tracking, and looking at the hands of the child. You can't see it quite so well in this photo, but in this one you can. The stretching of the tendons of the fingers and the palms. The eye tracking, focusing, and the activity of the hands is critical for future reading and writing. 
These things have to happen now so that later, when the child is ready to begin reading and writing, they have the motor capacity to handle those skills. We're fortunate that brain research is now catching up and recognizing the importance of early movement research and development. Exercising each new movement also creates pathways in the baby's brain, and there is no greater time for this to happen than in the first two and a half years. The child's development in the first seven years is guided by intense will activity. And for the baby, up to about age two and a half, this will is directed toward gross motor activity, taking hold of their body and refining their movements. And this will continue all the way through early childhood. They will continue to refine and further develop but there's no greater time for the intensity of this kind of activity than in the first two and a half years. We're going to now turn our attention to speech development. Like the development of movement, the development of speech also follows a pattern that is universal. Research has shown that babbling sounds of babies encompass all the language groups around the earth. And only gradually does the baby select the sounds of his own language. Eventually, the sounds that he doesn't hear in his environment, in his own mother tongue, they fall away. Leslie, can you click these along instead of letting it play? It's through language that the child can begin to form and express his own thoughts. And as with other capacities that unfold during the first seven years, speech requires human relationship and example. Initially, the adult leads the child into speech through intimate relationship. Within this sacred space, the adult both speaks and listens, enabling the first communication through spoken language to come forth. How does this affect the child's change in consciousness? There is a direct relationship between learning to speak and learning to think. The development of speech impacts his play more directly after the age of two and will awaken more and more complex and creative thinking, especially after four and a half. You're up to 20, 21, 22. Many of you will remember experiencing a change in your child sometime between two and three. Some children who were always very confident and independent might have become clingy. Others find every opportunity to defy us. And that's where this phrase, the terrible twos, comes into play. This is the time where they need boundaries and limits. And it's the time where they're just starting to really test those boundaries and limits. If we observe carefully, we can see a subtle shift in the child's awareness of herself during this stage of development. I think you all probably know this face. This is a time where the child's consciousness is changing, and there are so many new capacities at her fingertips, but she's not quite sure what to make of them. It's a time where the child begins to refer to herself as I. And she may have done this already, but now she's doing it in a much more conscious way. And as she refers to herself as I, she's able to refer to the other as you. And this creates a sense of separateness in the child that wasn't there before. Mommy and a toy is part of me in a younger child, which is why younger children can't share and why we don't expect them to, especially in parent-child. But with the separation comes the wish to be more independent. And to do things one as 
an individual. There's also a new sense of ability in regard to dressing oneself. Children begin to toilet train, they can feed themselves. And this is also the time where many children will self wean at this age. We're having a little technical difficulty, aren't we? <laughs> I can see that. With this newfound physical independence, there comes a new interest in the world. However, children need to feel secure in their environment and with others in their world. And in order to do this, they need to discover the boundaries, both the social boundaries and the physical boundaries. Children do this through testing. And it's our task to remain calm and firm during this sometimes stormy period so that he can find his bearings in the world through this new consciousness. So I've touched upon the three major areas of development in this period in the first two and a half years, including walking, talking, and thinking. And as a child begins to have this shift in consciousness, when we start to see the child looking out into the world, becoming more interested in the other, recognizing himself as an I, those are the moments that we begin to think, huh, this child might be ready for nursery. So my colleague Andrea Gambardella is going to talk more about this next period of development. Well, just savoring here for a moment some of the nice images that you've offered, Lisa. I'm wondering if um, I can ask you to just think about your own child for a moment and when he or she first came to walking and when they pulled themselves up. We saw those really nice images of that. And once your child was walking and really able to use their hands and their body in a new way, what surprised you? when they got off the floor and were really standing. You know, what were some of the things that really surprised you? What was new for you that you met in your child now that they were up on on just two feet, just the way you are? I want you to think about it for a moment, and then I'd like you to turn to the person next to you or behind you if you're sitting just with family, and just chat a moment about that. What was new for you when your child began to walk? I'll give you a couple minutes. So I'm Andrea Gambardella, and I'm a kindergarten teacher here. I have a group of 16 children, the four, five, and six-year-olds. And um, it was wonderful to hear Laura's story, which I haven't heard before. Um, I've been involved in world of education for 40 years. It's been all of my adult life and my occupation. Uh, I entered Waldorf education because I was disappointed in my own. And as I looked, as I looked in college, um, I thought I was uh, headed for one thing, and got really engaged with um, young children and how important education is and what a difference we can make in their lives when we get involved with them. And so ever since I was very young, I've been involved in early childhood education, studying human development. And it just never grows old. I never go, it's never tiring for me. It's ever an academic study and a joy and a delight to be with the children. So. Um, Lisa was talking about these young children, how they get to this point, two and a half, almost three, you know, what makes them kind of ready there to be in a group of other children. Children always like to be in the company of other children, even when they're infants. They always like to play and explore their environment. They always like to hear stories and interact and singing rhymes and games. They always want to be part of whatever you're doing that's interesting. So what really distinguishes them? We saw this really nice journey of how they come through this early stages and foundation of this uprightness, coming to walk, learning to speak and have a relationship with the world and things and what they do. And then there's other moments that just show that they are moving into a whole nother phase in life. You know, the, the children from birth to three their whole body is one whole world. That when you look at the body itself, it's round, it's padded everywhere. 
you know, even the fingers, all these places are padded. This one world that helps them find and hold their balance in life. And as Lisa was mentioning, you are in them. They are in you. I and the world are one. And even in the way they learn to speak, a single word means so much. My oldest um, child, her first word was Dutch. And that was the name of the dog that lived across the street. And when she saw the mother, the father, the child, anyone that came in and out of that house, the car, they were all Dutch because they all belonged to this one world that lived over there. So everything is this wonderful wholeness in these first three years. But then this, there's a turning point for those children. Something else happens as they grow and mature. And Lisa um, began to talk about this, how when they first start to call themselves I, not just out of imitating your speech, but because they sense something in themselves that is now not just all one whole world as part of, but there's I and there's you. There's I and the world. Now, they, at three, they can't speak about this themselves, but there's clearly a separation that begins to happen. And in Waldorf education, we really t pay quite a lot of attention to these transition moments. There's one at three, at six years old. These children also experience another big separation of I and the world at age nine, at age 12 and 13, another one, and in the high school yet again, as the children mature and come into a sense of self. In our first grades in, um, in Waldorf schools, our children learn to read out of writing, so they are writing first. And when they first enter first grade, they do something we call form drawing, which is a way of, of practicing, actually, a lot of the hand movement in writing. And one of the first exercises they do is they draw a line and they draw a curve. And I really like this image of the line and the curve, because for me, the human body is like that. We're all lines and we're curves. And in our children, and as I study early childhood development and I watch these young children, I watch them going from this great roundness, this great curve, and very slowly through these years, three to, through five, and then five to seven, they move this curve and it gets straighter and straighter and straighter. So in these first three years, there's this round, curvaceous life all encompassing here and then from three to five it begins to pull in just a little bit and even though the, their hands are still well padded the soles of their feet still those three and four year olds have that tummy you know still even five you know you see but you can also see how the neck is a little longer the arms are a little longer now they can actually reach to pull their socks up, you know, whereas that two and a half year old can barely get down there with their, with their arms. And there's this wonderful line and curve. So this curve just keeps starting to pull in and it pulls the world into focus a little bit more. And in these very young children from birth to three, their gaze is downward and it's just very close at hand. That's where the gaze is. But when the child becomes three and four, their gaze is outward now. Now, again, at six, it becomes even farther, and that curve gets a little more to the line, whereas they march straight ahead. But these three, four, and five-year-olds, it's just coming in a little bit, and the gaze is a little further out. So it isn't just right here is what's in front of me, but it's also you, and you can start, they can start to incorporate others around them. So as I mentioned, they're, they're, what do they do in their bodies? Well, they're, they're not quite as, pat, quite as padded, though you see this nice roundness. And you see that their gait is more balanced. And they're, they're able to assess good risk taking even more. So these children are really practicing a lot of what they've acquired in the first three years. These first three years are all about acquiring these skills. And now ages three, four, and five, are about practicing these skills, establishing these skills, entering, beginning to enter into a little mastery and challenging them. So there's a lot of climbing, a lot of jumping, a lot of rolling, crawling under things, climbing on top of things, 
and being able to gather the world around them and manipulate them. Another special thing about these three, four, and five-year-olds is that their whole world of feeling life is awakening in a very different way. In these very young children, under three, they're full of emotion. They're full of emotion, but it comes directly out of how they're feeling in, internally, you know, just their well-being and their ill-being, and immediate things that happen in the environment. They're startled, or they're surprised, or they're delighted, you know, by something that you've done with them. Um, but these, these children, once they've turned that point in, at three or so, and they're saying I to themselves, when their gaze turns outward to others, now their feeling life is becoming structured inwardly. Now their feelings are separate from just their environment, but they are, are hold it inside of themselves. They can step back a little bit. They can weigh and consider the things that they do. Um, and so they can take these risks, like I mentioned, going up slides and deciding, hmm, now that I'm at the top, am I coming back down the stairs or am I actually going down that slide? And being a lot more adventurous about it. Another wonderful thing that happens is that their, their play changes. These very young children, everything in their environment is a discovery. We saw that great image of that baby finally reaching that toy and then, oh, went in the mouth and that's where she explored it first. And it's about the movement of it. What does it do? You know, what is, yeah, just how can I manipulate it? Um, what is that about? But at three, four, and five, everything is released from the confinement of its ordinary purpose. So a spoon or a twisted stick or a leaf or a shell, you know, is no longer just a leaf or a twisted stick. It becomes a whole world of itself because the child can take this wonderful object, release it from its, its form, and it, from their own imagination build a whole world. And that's what really distinguishes those, that first stage of life to this next little stage here. They have this whole inner world that begins to enliven. And when they have this inner world that, that, that is there and they're building it, now they're able to invite others into this world with them. And though children always like being in the company of other children, it's here at three and four and five that they really want to invite and engage. And at three, they mostly like them around them, you know, and like having them with them and someone to exchange things with occasionally. Not a lot of sharing or you know, peacemaking there yet. Um, and at four, now they start to really dialogue about it. At five, the play really engages in a verbal way. And at six, well, Leslie will tell you all about that later. <laughs> Something new altogether. But this, this inner life you know, is beginning to be structured for these children. And so they can turn outward and invite you into it. And they can express their emotions and their feelings. Their language and their vocabulary grows a lot around their feeling life. Their play is still very object-oriented, though. If it isn't there, then it isn't stimulating them. Um, but, they, but everything around them is really activating that imagination. Once they've left this phase and move on to five and a half and six years old, then they carry an inner world that where they can close their eyes and don't need anything at all. But in this middle stage, three, four, and fives, it's all about what's there, right, in their environment. So this readiness to be in a nursery group has a lot to do with this inner capacity, this new inner capacity that they have for themselves. They have a self-regulation. Typically, they're dry and out of diapers during the day. They have a self-awareness of others that's awakened in their play through imitation. The child can join in a, in a simple group and rhythm of the day and move along. Um, they have a whole measure of self-regulation that begins to help them with their, um, what do I call that, that, the way they just problem solve with their hands all the time. <laughs> um, this also can, be, um, can begin to be more socially um, pro uh, Successful. Let's put socially successful. Let's call it that way. And this self-awareness al allows them to, to carry you inside of them, and then be able to say goodbye to you at the door, you know? because now they carry you as a little separate from them. 
So this line and this curve, you know, this great roundness from birth to three, and from them from three to five, those children slowly bring in that curve a little bit straighter as they build their own world, as their gaze goes outward, and as they invite others to join them in their play. Now I'd like you to take a moment and think about your own child and their play now, regardless of what age they are. Just think about the things that attract them right now, the things that they like to do. And I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and talk about the things that your child is playing right now. I wonder if there are any examples of your children's play that you could share this evening with us. Yeah? Yeah? Oh, it's a, I'm, I'm sorry, say it again. He's, wow. That's great. And how old is your son? Yeah. Jay was just saying how his son has set up a grocery store in his room. And it's such a wonderful example, right? It's everything and anything, right? It, it's fair game. An empty cereal box, right? The stick at the door, the stone on the way, uh, the lid of a jar. It all becomes fair game for them. Any other examples? I was just sharing something that happened last week, a few days ago. Um, my son was coming back, he's in the nursing, he's three years old, and he was coming back home and I asked him, what did you do in, in school today? And he said, oh mom, I fed the goat. I was, oh really, did you feed the goat? You know, what did she eat? Oh, she ate carrots. <laughs> carrot? Oh yes. And then, uh, what else did you do? Then I fed the chicken and the cow. He started talking about a lot of different animals that he <clears> fed. <throat> and I was, oh really, but so you went to the farm? Oh yes, we went to the farm. And how did you go? Because it was like, wow, it was a very cold day. It was, so you walked all the way to the farm. Oh, no, mom, we took the plane. And I was like, oh, you took the plane. Then I got it, you know? Then I was like, and so we were talking about this, how they can get so well into the, like, he was really talking serious. He, he, he did go to the farm, you know, and he did feed the, the animals. And how we lose all this capacity. I was so, like, I wanted to hug him, you know? Like, it was, it's so nice. It's like, uh, and, and yesterday I bought a, a vase with a plant to put in my in the living room and then this morning when he woke up he took the, the, the plant to his room and he started playing and then he was that he was this was a forest and he was playing in the forest and then when he went to, to school I put the vase back in the living room because this was for the decoration <laughs> of the living room and then he got so mad when he came back home he went straight to look for the forest forest was not there so he's Mom, my forest is not in my living room. And oh, I'm sorry, this forest was for the living room. So, and um, I can buy you another one. No, this is my forest. So now it's, it's the plant is in his room. Because, uh, you know, I have to buy another one. Because it's, uh, it's amazing. So he's really into his imagination. Well, it's a wonderful example because the imagination is completely real. It's entirely a reality for them. The store, the forest. In the, in the potty plant, right? And imitation is, um, is, a, is, the, is the key for everything for them. They learn everything through imitating their world and being in the world. And he, was, he has been in the forest, he has been in the store. And so they, and they take this up and it lives this, this strong, strong reality. And I think that this is a moment where I can say this is, is so important to take care with the exposure your children has to screens and movies and these kinds of images. Because those images that are given with those kinds of stories become very fixed in our child. And they, they crowd out the imagination that is so wonderfully blossoming that you experience and witness at this time. Those images are, um, they are not mobile, they are not, uh, they are not servants to the imagination. Whereas the things that your child um, awakens in them out of the found things, so you know, it just so happens there's a new plant in the house, it just so happens these, these things are available to them to make a store. These found things allow them this freedom 
this wonderful freedom to, to grow their own independent thinking out of this play. But the fixed images on a screen go in there, they crowd all of that out and get stuck, and then that's what they have available to them. And that's what they know. They own, can only repeat those images. They can only copy those images. But they cannot transform them and become something else. So it's just a little caution there. Um, out of these beautiful examples of some of the play, I wonder if we just have another couple examples of play. I, I don't know. I, mean, I wanted to ask a question. My son's only 15 months, so we're not here yet. But I've seen other children like, around this age, three, four, five, with the little mini iPads. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen them. Oh. And I'm everybody's like, oh, you're a child. And I'm like, no, I don't want that. And everybody's like, it's technology. And I'm like, I feel like that stunts their imagination. So I'm just asking if you feel that that's the same, or am I just being over? We really caution against any screen use for children in the before the grades and, and even older. We really caution against it for many, many reasons. Some has to, mm -hmm. even has to do with their physical development, their eye muscles and all that sort of thing. Um, but we're really looking to engage the child like that baby that was like reaching and reaching and reaching. That's what we want to do. We want to develop that perseverance, that persistence, that will out of themselves to do. And when you're confined as a child like this, when, when your whole life is about movement, movement in, in their imagination, movement of the body, we, we find that really confining and really have to ask the question, what, what is your child not doing when they are engaging them? <coughs> we are not Luddites. We love our technology. We know that this is our world. And we, we look forward to the day when the children are older and at a really ripe age to engage in that way. You know, it has its purpose in the world, and it definitely has purpose all of our worlds and theirs too. But at this young age, they really need to engage themselves. They need to know the world by experiencing the world first, before they live in a virtual way. And I think that's something for when people are much older. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of examples here. Yeah, um, the other day I read a story to my son, you know, when he was five and a half, and um, somewhere in the story it mentioned the Nautilus on the submarine, and uh, last week on Saturday I come home, and in the living room he had built the Nautilus out of pillows and blankets mm -hmm. and a little tunnel, and um, you know, as soon as I walked in the door, I said, like, come on dad, you have to come in the Nautilus with me, come see what it is, mm -hmm. and it was just, it was, it was amazing, just from like one or two pages in a book three nights ago, he's able to build his own submarine. One uh, thing that I find so uh, wonderful with my son is that he has uh, started imitating his teacher lighting the candle at mealtime. And he uh, does it with sort of, you know, it's sort of in a slow motion, like I guess maybe she does. And so he just found some random objects. I think one of them is like actually a wine opener and another random sort of plastic cylinder that's the candle. And every time we have a meal, he has to light the candle. And he always, you know, tells us to, you know, shh, you know, and make it quiet. And then he does it so slowly as if he's lighting the match and lighting the candle. And I, I always find it, and he does it every night. I think it's really a pretty great imitative uh, play action. Thank you very much. Beautiful examples. Nice and nice. You see it right before you, these unfolding capacities of these children, this blossoming imagination, and the social capacity of the things that they bring. So, Leslie, you can bring us to the last part of our, our evening with the child from five to seven. I'm also going to try this, but in the beginning, I'd like your help in a few of the first few slides. So first, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Leslie Rochelle Fox. I teach kindergarten here. Um, I have taught nursery before. I taught at the Waldorf School in Baltimore for six years. Um, so I've been teaching about eight, almost close to 18 years now. And when I heard Laura's story, I have to tell you, I found Waldorf education in 1990 as well. So. 
that's another part of the biography we have to share. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, I look at these photographs and I hear what my colleagues have been saying, and you know what a marvel it is at the human development, and and how fortunate we are that we have an opportunity to witness this development and also try and understand what it's all about. Um, so the first slide, mm, keep going, there. That's my grand nephew, I had to get him in here. Um, <laughs> but I have three slides that really show this um, comparison of the, the ratio of the head to the rest of the body. And so here he is about eight or nine months and you can see that um, his head is about three to twelve in terms of length of his body. And then the next slide, we have a three-year-old and you can see where his head is about one to five. And then almost six-year-old and his head is in relationship to his body about 2 to 12. So you see this changing, this lengthening, this stretching of their body, um, of their limbs, and then how their head has a different relationship to their physicality as they continue to develop. So that's one of the first things that we really notice is, you know, when you look at it, an infant, they seem all head. Just, and then gradually their head comes into um, a different proportion to the rest of their body. And we also notice that their necks lengthen and their trunks and they begin to have a, a waist and we see knuckles and kneecaps, so you know what, the dimples are, they're losing their dimples, and they get an arch in their foot. Um, that also enables him to stand on that log in a different way. Um, facially, you know, that baby appearance disappears, and um, the second dentition has begun, so they begin to lose their primary teeth and um, they gain six-year molars. So when you look in their mouth, up until the time that they get their six-year molars, there's ten teeth on the bottom, ten on the top, and then you can count, when you count twelve on the top and twelve on the bottom, then you know those six-year molars are in. So how do we meet the developing physical body of the young child? You've seen and you've heard about the need that they have for movement in, in all aspects of their daily life. And we try to provide as many opportunities as possible. We see them becoming more physically adept. They're able to direct their actions with purpose when they move. They no longer, the younger child kind of moves as if they're lightly dancing. And then um, they begin to have a relationship to the earth in a different way. And that it's not so much that something invisible is moving them, but that they're moving themselves. Um, I'm going to try and move this one. If you can bear with this fading out, all right. They begin to, um, you know, walk on a balance beam, and they will skip and gallop and uh, really test their capacities. They run. Um, they can hop on either foot, and they can climb with ease. any opportunity they have to climb and to create things to climb or to find things in the forest to climb and work with their balance and try not to fall into that stream and jump off of, I'm, you just have to look at that for a minute. <laughs> I, 
I stood and watched it happen. <laughs> there was a big pillow down below that they were jumping into, but it was marvelous that those that wanted to really take that risk and do it, did it. Um, yeah. They also... <laughs> They seek the movement they need. They can sew, they can finger crochet, <clears throat> they can hammer a nail, sand and polish wood, they can buckle and unbuckle their clothes. And there, in that photograph, you see that they really can master control of a brush or a crayon or use a utensil, and they have this three-finger pincer grip. That's what we are speaking of when we talk about this pincer grip that they have, where they, they really take control of their body. And they're really challenging their capacities. So now we're just going to move into the social and emotional realm of the late five, six, going on to seven-year-old, school-ready child. They develop feelings for others, and they really have this need for deeper friendships. They were trying to force this, one, this girl out of the trees. Her feelings had been hurt. Um, they, they also... <clears throat> awareness for authority and it's evidenced in the kind of play that they do where they play mommy, daddy, um, baby, queen, uh, king and queen. Um, they have opportunities to play animals. Um, they also begin to visualize their play. They don't really need a lot of objects, but they can just talk about it. And it really indicates this ability to separate concept, which is their inner world, from percept or perception, which is the outer world. They're also getting better at sharing their teacher's attention as well as I'm going to need your help. As well as just taking turns, making room for more friends. They aren't, um, they don't rely on a security blanket of some sort, sucking their thumbs or um, needing a blanket. And they grow in self confidence so that. They, they have their own imagination, but they can live into another's imagination and share that and then create a puppet show together. And so we provide a lot of opportunities for them to do this and to gain that confidence. Um, here, they worked at getting four children in that barrel by the time it was over with. So they love contact and um, they love to try uh, and, and make room for their friends in many creative ways. Um, so we, we try and really support these emerging capacities. Um, you can see the look on her face. She's not really happy about what's going on, <laughs> but we just give them opportunities to really uh, experience the conflict, to struggle to find a solution before we step in and make it all better. We listen, we remain an assuring presence in their play, and we try and provide tools for resolution when there seems to be a roadblock. Now we're going to just move on to the area of thinking. So we've talked about their physical capacities, their social and emotional capacities, and what's going on with their thinking. They love to tie things up. You saw that with the younger child. Why 
having to tie something on a child's wrist. But they begin to tie things together. They begin to think about, you know, if I do this, then what will happen? Um, it, and it gives an indication as well that they're really starting to tie their thoughts together. Um, they, this, they were dropping a key down through the holes in all of these stools and just What's going to happen if we put it through here? Is it going to go all the way to the bottom? Where is it going to get stuck? Um, they're really interested in the world. How does it work? They want to explore everything. What can they find in the smallest pebble? They also love mechanical operations. You know, not only do they make things, but then they wonder, and how does it work? If I hold it a certain way, is the wind going to catch it? Um, they love, this is Big Ben, by the way, uh, just the creation of all kinds of objects in the room. They build ramps, and they try and find ways to move objects from one place to another. Um, they've been known to s sit someone in that little <laughs> roller coaster cart at the top and hold on to it and bring them down on the the, uh, the rocker board. So um, they make plans. Look, the intention in his eyes. Um, they construct amazing things. And they develop all kinds of schemes and create these elaborate constructions. Okay. They ask real questions, not just for the sake of saying why, but they really they ask questions and want to know. They talk through their play and they have serious discussions. They also begin to learn how to carry out complex, multi-step directions and perform tasks with a minimum of teacher direction. Their verbal skills are well developed. They really enjoy conversation with their peers. And they also can, stay, can sustain their attention and listen intently. So, they're also in this area of um, physical development, you know, in movement and in social and emotional. They also are developing their intention. They're mastering their bodies, they're growing in their thinking, and their intention is growing with purpose. So they, they seek purposeful work. So they can apply their movements to solving the problems and carry out tasks. So if they're just given what the tools they need, they'll, they'll put it together. They show conscious goals in their activity. This took um, about two weeks to unearth this boulder. Mm -hmm. And every day they came out with shovels. We're going to move it. And there wasn't a lot of this boulder showing in the beginning. But they knew that something was underneath that small piece that was showing. And they worked at it and worked at it until they were able to lift it with their shovels and move it. They love to run errands, and um, they can really sustain a task for a long time, like practicing the monkey bars until they really have accomplished it. They also have a growing awareness, and they often get frustrated about the difference between their inner intention and then what they really can do. So you'll hear them say, I can't do it. But you'll also hear them say, I'm bored. I don't know what 
to do. And in their feeling life, they show um, an ability to really manage taking turns, uh, thinking about the other, and we're really, they're, they're learning how to delay their gratification through this. They love to wrap objects and make beautiful creations out of nature. They like to whisper and have secrets and really enjoy being with their peers. They enjoy that company of their peers, but they're also comfortable in the solitude that they have in moments. So all these qualities that I spoke about and that we all spoke about with about enthusiasm and initiative and social skills, this natural curiosity for learning, this all comes about in a gradual way. And you've seen that through what we've shared this evening. But just as a butterfly that slowly and gradually emerges from the cocoon, your child just doesn't suddenly wake up and they're able to do these spe specific tasks on a given day. It all slowly emerges. And we're just doing our best to really nurture that so that we can protect that rightful unfolding of their capacities. Um, to what extent uh, do you you know, direct of uh, one activity or, or like maybe prepare the environment. Like one example, the, um, the chairs that are, you know, the, all the chairs and then there was a, they would jump to a, a pillow. Like, did you leave the chairs there and they, they were the ones who made it or you made it? Like, this is something. I didn't do anything at all. Like, really? Oh. Other than watch, you know, I made sure that Certain things were secure, and maybe I'd hand them something. Try this here. But for the most part, that is totally their creation. So they are the ones who initiate. Yeah. Like also the stone, the big stone that they want to, like, absolutely. Yeah. You know, with all of the the things that we provide in the environment, it's a lot of um, making a lot out of with nothing, yeah. right? Th these stools, that's, they sit on them to have snack, you know? Um, or, they, or for a story time, but they are available for them. And out of their own inventiveness, their own ingenuity, their own maturation and interest in how do things work, how can I replicate something that I've seen or thought about? You know, we just give permission for them to do that and make sure that they're safe and take care of each other. And, you know, I, I, you, well, I was just going to say one of those slides that Leslie showed that showed the children coming down over a roller coaster, I would bet that that happened the Monday after Fall Fair. <laughs> so if you imagine Fall Fair and the Dragon Run, on Monday morning, they come back in and they recreate what they've experienced. So we can tell you who has construction going on in their house. We know who's had a plumber visit. We know who's had the lawn people over. We know who's been to the hospital recently. We know who has a baby on the way in the family. Because they're recreating their play every day. And the younger the child, the more they're going to react to their environment and play out of what is there, mostly through gross motor exploration. The older children are the ones who already are sitting at the snack table before playtime, and they're planning. They know that when they get outside, they're going to get those shovels, and they're going to go, and they're going to work on that rock. They know that they're going to get the play stools and set them up in a certain way. And sometimes, the older they are, the more they talk about what they're going to do, and they never actually get around to implementing it. <laughs> so, again, it, it really depends upon the age of the children. But mm -hmm. in most cases, they're recreating something that they've already seen or experienced in some form or fashion. 
know my colleagues have heard this already, but with those stools, one of my kindergarten classes really made an elevator. Stacking the stools and working with those, we call them roly polies, tying them to a stool in the middle, sitting a child in that stool, pulling on them and lifting them up and down and taking turns riding in an elevator. It was just amazing. And I did not do anything. What we do, though, is provide them with the environment and the raw materials to be able to recreate those experiences. Yes? I feel pretty comfortable with the play area. I, I feel like I have a little nursery school in my home um, with a six-year-old, an almost four-year-old, and a two-year-old, you know, playing for hours on it. The part that I wonder about is when you do need to intervene, when there is um, an unkindness being said, or, you know, the children can't resolve it, and it needs to set them. Um, or what might appear, maybe it's not right to call it rudeness, but might appear as rudeness at the table, let's say. Or, um, do you have tips on, can you tell me how you guys deal with uh, when you need to step in? I'm, I'm fine with like the standing back and letting them do aspects. Um, do you follow me? I think it depends on, so on, well, first of all, it depends on the age of the child because everything that we do comes out of an understanding of child development. So what I might do in parent-child is very different from what my colleagues in the kindergarten might do. And I think that in general, we recognize that there's also this quality of a risk assessment and, and hazard. So in a hazard situation, we're very quick to step in. If it's a situation where the children are taking age-appropriate risks, then we're present and we're aware of what might be unfolding, but we're also letting them have the opportunity to assess what that risk might be. If it's conflict, the moment that it spills over to, into aggression, that is another time where we're going to step in because conflict is healthy. And in order to learn how to resolve conflict, you need an opportunity to work through conflict. But the moment someone is liable to get hurt or it's spilling over into more than just conflict, then we're going to intervene. You have children in the, at very different ages, so it depends on who's doing what um, to specifically give an example of how to meet a behavior with a six-year-old would be very different than the way one might with a three-year-old. Mm. Um, my six-year-old is what gives me the question mark. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> um, six-year-olds, you will have them, lots of them. I was going to say, you know, from having observed all of you, what's masterful is that to be direct rather than, so rather than directly commenting on behavior, be directing the attention towards some other yes, something. Yes, at six years old, that's appropriate. You shouldn't think, meet them like this when it's like you're trying to create your own environment. Right. And maybe I should talk to you aside if this is getting too specific. <laughs> no, it's a good question, yeah, Andrew. Well, just to say that. Um, often, um, one thing that we can offer is that we try to perceive what is it that's right that's creating this, so that um, so that we can speak to that and give them the language and vocabulary to become more adept in their own problem solving. So, um, yeah. It's, you know, the six-year-old is going to want to be more the boss of everything and um, uh, not have much patience with other ideas sometimes, mm -hmm. especially from younger ones. Another six-year-old would stand their ground and, like, you know, negotiate until mm -hmm. it was satisfying for both of them. Um, so there's there's this, an element of, of working with the mixed ages where 
we, we look to. So what's what's behind all of that, right? Yeah, what's, what's really happening? happening? Yes. What what inaugurated? What initiated that? What's behind all that? So that you can just offer a caveat. Oh, I see. You really wanted this to happen. Well, you know, you can say, this is. You know, this is what I. This is what I. This is my idea. This is where it's going to go. Instead of like, no, no, no. You know, yeah. this kind of thing. So to just keep offering more vocabulary to help navigate it all. Also, with a six-year-old, you can also say, and you know, in in this case, I we use the images of big brother and big sister. You're the big brother. You know, in this, she wants a turn. You know, and it's so wonderful that you can be the captain. But she wants a turn. You can be the big brother and make room here at this time. So you can also call on the difference in the ages too. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll be here for a few minutes longer. It doesn't sound as if any questions are perking up in the group, but if you have an individual question and you want to come towards us after everyone starts to move out, that's fine too. So thank you all for coming tonight. We really appreciate you coming out. I want to just thank Larry for all the tech assistance and <laughs> Laura especially for opening up our, our program tonight. Thank you.